Good evening. I'm John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Civil War Roundtable. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. Inspired by the United States Constitution and the history, the values, and the spirit of the Union League of Philadelphia, the Legacy Foundation's mission is to create more informed, more engaged citizen leaders. We do this through a host of programs, starting with the care of our wonderful collection, largely Civil War collection, but also related collections, including that of the Military Order of the Loyal Legion and the Civil War Museum of Philadelphia. We also provide civics education for high school students, scholarships to tomorrow's citizen leaders, and we provide a host of programs such as the exhibit behind me, which is currently uh, mounted in, our, in the Heritage Center, and lectures like tonight's Civil War Roundtable. Recently, the Legacy Foundation uh, produced and presented our annual Lincoln Day commemoration and celebration. It was really a uh, really fantastic day, despite or perhaps because it was virtual. It was really a, an interesting uh, program viewed by our largest, I think it's our largest program of the year. But if you haven't seen it, you still can view it. It is on our YouTube channel, as all of our programs are. So uh, I think we're going to share right now, actually, that link to our YouTube channel. But you can always just go to YouTube, type in the Union League Legacy Foundation, and all of our programs over the last year uh, are there for you to view. All of this is made possible through the very generous donors, members, and others that share our values and want us to share them with many more people. So tonight, um, we will have about an hour-long program as we normally do. And towards the end of the program, there will be uh, time for Q&A. And if you'd like to ask a question, just use the Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom. And you can ask those questions anytime during the course of the program. We'll get to as many uh, of those questions as we can. And now to introduce our speaker, the historian of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Mr. Jim Mundy. Jim. Hey, John, thank you very much. And welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. So um, Greg Irwin probably has the loneliest job in Philadelphia. He's trying to teach Civil War history in an 18th century Revolutionary War town in a city that doesn't care yet a lot about the 19th century and the Civil War. But Greg has been plugging away for low these many years, trying to, you know, sow the seeds of Civil War history. And he's, and he's been doing it spectacularly well. So uh, we are once again happy to have Greg as one of our Civil War Roundtable speakers. Um, and so without, you didn't come to hear me talk, so I'm going to go to the introduction to Greg Irwin right now. So Gregory J. W. Warren is, is a professor of history at Temple University. He is a recent president of the Society for Military History and general editor of the Campaigns and Commander series at the University of Oklahoma Press. He earned his PhD at the University of Notre Dame in 1984 and taught at smaller schools in Kansas and Arkansas before arriving at Temple in 1999. Irwin has written or edited nine books, including Custer Victorious, The Civil War Battles of General George Armstrong Custer, Facing Fearful Odds, The Siege of Wake Island, Black Flag Over Dixie, Racial Atrocities and Reprisals in the Civil War, and Victory and Defeat, The Wake Island Defenders in Captivity, 1941 to 1945. He has also published more than 150 articles and essays. Irwin has appeared in many historical documentaries and served as an historical consultant and extra for the 1989 Civil War film, Glory. Greg, you have to tell everybody where we look for you in the movie then, all right? Okay, because I know I'm gonna start looking after this. So make sure you tell us, okay? All right. He is currently writing a social history of the 1781 British invasions of Virginia titled, When Freedom Wore a Red Coat. So ladies and gentlemen, it is our great honor and privilege and pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Gregory Irwin. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, also, thank you, John. Um, it's a pleasure, uh, as always, to uh, uh, speak at the Union League, albeit virtually, uh, but uh, also a pleasure to uh, commune under any circumstances with people who share an interest in history. I want to thank the uh, Union League Civil War Roundtable uh, for the invitation. Uh, to give this presentation and also to thank the Union League uh, Legacy Foundation for setting up everything 
Uh, let me get my uh, PowerPoint in order. There we, we go. I can see it. I hope you can too. I'm sure someone will tell me if, if, if it's not coming across. Uh, but uh, we might as well uh, begin because your time is valuable and I don't want to waste any of it. Any consideration of Abraham Lincoln as a war president must attempt to contrast image with historical reality. When it comes to Lincoln, of course, there is no shortage of images. Our conception of this fascinating, contradictory man has been shaped by a mountain of books and articles, as well as numerous works from photographers, painters, sculptors, poets, playwrights, and screenwriters. Perhaps the most appropriate way to start wrestling with this titanic figure is to consider the way that Union veterans, the men Lincoln considered his chief partners in the struggle to preserve the American experiment in federated self-government, how they viewed their commander in chief. On July 4th, 1894, the Cuyahoga County, Ohio, uh, Cuyahoga County, Ohio, dedicated its Soldiers and Sailors Monument, a $280,000 tribute in stone and bronze on Cleveland's spacious public square. Designed by Levi T. Schofield, a former Union Army captain turned architect, the monument featured a 15-foot statue of an armed goddess of liberty, um, uh, towering over the Cleveland skyline from a shaft more than 100 feet tall. Schofield guarded the approaches to the Soldiers and Sailors Monument with four larger than life groups of statuary, which he sculpted himself. These represented the contributions of the Union's four combat arms, the infantry, cavalry, artillery, and Navy. Inside the ornately carved granite and Amherst stone building encasing the shaft's base, Schofield placed four bronze base reliefs commemorating pivotal moments in the war. Schofield chose the entrance from Superior Avenue as the setting for the most dramatic of these scenes, the emancipation of the slave. Standing in the forefront of this tableau is Schofield's vision of Lincoln, the war president. What we see here is not the gentle father Abraham of beloved memory, but a virile militant man striking a pose of righteous defiance. Portrayed in full relief, he seems to be lunging from the bronze panel. Backed by four of Ohio's prominent wartime politicians, Salmon P. Chase, John Sherman, Benjamin Wade, and Joshua R. Giddings, and the serried ranks of the Union Army and Navy, Lincoln brandishes the broken shackles of slavery in his upraised right hand and extends a soldier's rifle uh, musket and, and the accoutrements uh, belonging to such a weapon to a muscular African-American who kneels in gratitude for his freedom but proudly holds his head upraised as he takes the oath of enlistment. This is Lincoln as the boys in blue remembered him, strong, decisive and willing to shake the foundations of America's social order to ensure the preservation of the Republic and to bestow a new birth of freedom. Ongoing surveys reveal that most American historians continue to rate Abraham Lincoln as this country's best president. This subjective judgment hinges primarily on Lincoln's performance as commander in chief in the Civil War, in which he surmounted a host of daunting challenges and succeeded in both preserving the Union and destroying slavery. Lincoln turned out to be more than a successful wartime chief executive. His actions defined the presidency's role in the American way of war, setting precedents that affected the conduct of his successors down to our own time. Professor Thierry Williams of Louisiana State University, a leading Civil War historian of the 1950s and 1960s, identified the qualities that made Lincoln such an effective commander in chief by quoting Karl von Clausewitz, uh, the Prussian uh, military uh, theorist. That astute veteran of the Napoleonic Wars whose ideas were unknown to Americans of Lincoln's day argued that a remarkable superior mind and strength of character mattered more in a war leader than extensive military experience. The conventional view of Lincoln as a war leader, which Professor Williams did so much to nurture, casts the melancholy Illinoisan as an untutored genius. 
He needed to be a genius as his resume for directing the largest armed conflict that his country had yet known was sadly deficient. Lincoln's only direct knowledge of soldiering came from a short turn as a militia captain in the Black Hawk War. He saw no combat, except for what he jokingly characterized as a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes. And he fell far short of distinguishing himself as an officer. Although an able lawyer and a masterful politician, Lincoln lacked the executive uh, experience deemed necessary to lead a nation through a trial as harrowing as the Civil War. Nevertheless, Lincoln possessed an array of traits and talents that made him equal to his terrible task. A highly intelligent man, he had a knack for cutting through superfluous detail to grasp the essence of complex issues and problems. He also benefited from clarity of vision and steel hard resolution. He knew exactly what he wanted to accomplish with his war, save the Union. Every other consideration took second place to that. Lincoln's obsession with preventing the balkanization of the United States rested on his conception of what his nation represented. He believed that the American Republic not only served the best interests of its own people, but offered a beacon of hope to the rest of humanity. This is what Lincoln, sa uh, this is what Lincoln meant when he said, this is essentially a people's contest. On the side of the Union, it is a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life. This almost mystical vision of America's mission to lead the human race to a freer form of existence is why Lincoln called his cause the last best hope of earth, humanity's only chance to avoid a future cursed by tyranny and darkness. And because the Union's preservation meant so much to so many, Lincoln was willing to do whatever it took to accomplish that objective. Beginning with a moderate military policy that attempted to subdue the Confederacy without touching slavery, Lincoln would steadily escalate the war by endorsing harsher measures championed by the radical Republicans and putting his own twist on them. Property confiscation, slave emancipation, and finally the widespread destruction of both public and private resources in the rebellious states. Lincoln also decided that the, that the demands of national security occasionally justified the curtailment of civil liberties. The president boldly suspended the writ of habeas corpus and subjected citizens that he and his subordinates deemed disloyal to arrest without warrant and trial by military tribunals. The Lincoln administration went so far as to temporarily close down hostile newspapers or refuse others the right to mail issues to subscribers. Lincoln's critics denounced him as a despot in language much more violent than that aimed uh, uh, earlier this century at George W. Bush after the passage of the Patriot Act and the establishment of a detention center for suspected terrorists at Guantanamo Bay. In an incredible coincidence, a British protest in the summer of 1864 revealed that some of these political prisoners during that time were subjected to a painful form of water torture, a practice that the White House issued no strictures to suppress. Lincoln even acquiesced in the persecution of his most virulent congressional critic, Representative Clement L. Vallandigham of Ohio, who was tried for treason and exiled to the Confederacy. Yet for all these extreme examples, Lincoln did not wield his inferred powers as commander in chief in an arbitrary fashion. Mark E. Neely Jr. won a 1992 Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Fate of Liberty, Abraham Lincoln and Civil Liberties, which determined that the Union government made most of its military arrests in those areas that could be considered militarily sensitive, the border states and conquered stretches of the Confederacy. Nevertheless, Lincoln came close to arguing that the end justifies the means when he inserted this appeal defending the suppression of dissidents in his famous message, message to Congress on July 4th, 1861. At that time, he, he wrote, are all the laws but one 
to go unexecuted and the government itself go to pieces, lest that one be violated? Because Lincoln said it, and said it more than a century and a half ago, it does not sound as unsettling as it would coming from a more recent occupant of the White House. But those chilling words testified how far the 16th president would go to win his war. No one knew that better than Robert Garlick Hill Keen, an official in the Confederate War Department who vented to his diary on August 26, 1863, all the revolutionary vigors with the enemy in legislation and execution, with us timidity, hair splitting, and an absence of all policy. Lincoln stretched the Constitution and international law in other ways when he felt that circumstances warranted. During the war's first month, he ordered the expansion of the Union Navy and regular army, and also the enlistment of long-term volunteer troops without the authorization of Congress. He proclaimed the implementation of a naval blockade along the Confederate coast, even though such a tactic normally required a declaration of war. Lincoln never requested such a mandate, as that would have implied recognition of the Confederacy as a separate nation, a principle Lincoln refused to concede. He remained adamant that he was quelling an insurrection and not suppressing a legitimate bid for Southern independence. That was why the official Union name for this conflict was the War of the Rebellion. As T. Harry Williams and other historians see it, Lincoln demonstrated a similar perspicacity in his conduct of military affairs. They credit him with a greater appreciation for overall strategy than many of his generals. Lincoln decided early on that victory depended on the destruction of Confederate armies and not just the occupation of territory. Likewise, he realized that the best way to utilize the North's numerical superiority was to have Union field armies cooperate by launching coordinated offensives against the entire enemy perimeter. That would prevent the outnumbered rebels from shifting reserves to threaten sectors and hasten their collapse. Our state, he wrote to two of his generals in early 1862, my general idea of the war to be that we have the greater numbers and the enemy has the greater facility of concentrating forces upon the points of collision, that we must fail unless we can find some way of making an advantage, uh, making an advantage of overmatch for his. And this can be done only by menacing him with superior forces at different points at the same time. Lincoln also receives credit for giving the Union military a unified command system even though it took him more than half the war to identify the senior commanders who would make it work effectively. Lincoln facilitated that development by acquiring the confidence and judgment to relieve incompetent uh, or mediocre generals and replace them with commanders imbued with the energy, imagination, and killer instinct necessary to win America's bloodiest war. Once Lincoln handed the reins of high command to Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, another unpretentious Midwesterner who saw the war as he did, he could stand back and let the Union Army and Navy do their job. Well, that is the familiar view of how Lincoln ran the Civil War, a formula repeated countless times and in a wide variety of formats. Like so many other aspects of the Civil War, Lincoln's role has been lacquered with a veneer of sentimentality and wrapped in a sense of inevitability that prevent us from appreciating just how horrible that conflict was and what sort of man it took to win it. The fact that the United States became one of the world's richest and most productive nations in the generation following Appomattox inclines Americans to regard the Civil War simply as a slight detour in the Republic's irrepressible rise to greatness. They forget that Republics have been an anomaly for most of human history, and that this country came perilously close between 1861 and 1865 to joining history's long list of failed democracies. Somehow Americans regard the four years of ferocious mass murder that pinned the Union back together as the expression of something noble in the American character rather than a manifest tragedy that unleashed baser impulses. 
Lincoln fits in this romanticized picture as kind old Father Abraham, who's soaring rhetoric and advocacy for a conciliatory peace settlement converted the war into a purging process that made America better as well as stronger. This tendency to reduce history to an inspiring pageant helps foster a sense of national pride and identity to be sure, but it deprives us of some of the most important lessons that the past has to teach us. In particular, this larger than life Lincoln, part prophet, part secular saint, robs the man of his humanity and impedes the ability of this generation of embattled Americans to relate to him and profit properly from his example. Lincoln himself is partly responsible for our clouded perception. Like other public figures, he donned masks that suited certain circumstances, and those masks still keep us from getting to know the inner man. A good example of such ob obfuscation uh, is this seemingly a uh, typical example of Lincoln-esque humility. I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. While there is much truth in that statement, it would be a mistake to think that fate alone turned Abraham Lincoln into a war president. He chose that role for himself through a series of calculated decisions fraught with peril. Unable to believe that most white Southerners actually wished to turn their backs on their common heritage with the North, Lincoln rejected efforts to resolve the secession crisis through compromise. The newly inaugurated president risked armed conflict by refusing to evacuate Fort Sumter, the federal island fortress that sat in full view of Charleston, South Carolina, the secessionist seedbed and most militant city in the newborn Confederacy. After Confederate gunners bombarded Sumter and forced the removal of its garrison, Lincoln embraced a military solution by summoning 75,000 militiamen to suppress the Southern Rebellion. In the weeks before Lincoln took office, he dismissed pleas for a compromise solution by telling Republican senators, the tug has to come and better now than any time hereafter. He may have been right, most historians believe that Fort Sumter had assumed such a symbolic importance in the Union's camp that its seizure demanded Lincoln meet force with force or appear impotent. On the other hand, it could be argued that precipitating hostilities over a battle that cost no human lives was an overreaction, and Lincoln might have gained more by continuing to play a waiting game. Regardless of this question of timing, we should not forget that this cunning and often ruthless man ended up committing himself and his countrymen to paying an exceedingly heavy price in both blood and treasure to save the union he so revered. In achieving that goal, he adopted war policies that visited catastrophic repercussions on both friend and foe. Lincoln could not foresee how destructive the Civil War was going to be, and the heat of that inferno seared his soul as much as any other American who experienced it. Nevertheless, he dragged the Republic through the valley of the shadow because he could, could conceive of no other way to keep it whole. Abraham Lincoln wrote his name across that, uh, the pivotal period of American history in letters of fire that consumed the lives of, it's estimated now, about 75, uh, 750,000 soldiers in blue and gray, 750,000. In the spirit of Shakespearean drama, it is only fitting that the conflagration he helped light should claim him among its final victims. One of the prevailing themes in the literature of the Civil War, uh, Lincoln, is how much he grew in office. When it came to military affairs, however, historians often gloss over how much growing this shrewd country lawyer needed to do. Lincoln made mistakes, big mistakes, even after he had years of experience under his belt. Lincoln's faults were especially evident in the months leading up to war and the struggle's first year. He consistently underestimated the commitment of the seven states of the Lower South to the Confederacy that they formed in February 1861. He thought if he followed a passive course and played for time, white Southerners would calm down and return to the Union. Lincoln finally took aggressive action after the attack on Fort Sumter by mobilizing 75,000 militia. He may have hoped that gesture would have had an intimidating effect on the secessionists. It did not. In fact, it made matters infinitely worse 
by prompting Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Arkansas into joining the Confederacy too. This development greatly prolonged the war as these four states would furnish more than 40% of the Southern nation's soldiers, more than 50% of its industrial capacity, half of its food crops, and close to half of its horses and mules. The idea that Lincoln steadily became a better judge of military talent as the war went on and filled the Union high command with superior officers is also open to question. True, he had enough sense to elevate Ulysses S. Grant to the rank of Lieutenant General and appointed him uh, General in Chief of the Armies of the United States in mid-March 1864. But he still hobbled Grant with a coterie of highly placed political generals who had repeatedly demonstrated their military limitations over the past three years. As the campaign season opened that spring, Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, commanded the Department of the Gulf with headquarters at New Orleans. Based out of Fort Monroe, Virginia, Major General Benjamin F. Butler, a one-time Democratic congressman from Massachusetts, was supposed to cooperate with Grant's offensive against Richmond by advancing on the rebel capital from the east with the Army of the James. The erratic and temperamental Major General Franz Siegel, the darling of the North's German-American community, stood poised to hand the Confederates yet another victory in the Shenandoah Valley as commander of the Department of West Virginia. This lackluster threesome did not hold token backwater commands. Lincoln gave them control of major field armies which magnified their inadequacies into serious threats to the health of the Union cause. Siegel's blunders, for instance, permitted the Confederates to once again utilize the Shenandoah Valley as an invasion corridor. Hoping to reduce Union pressure on Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia, Lieutenant General Jubilee early marched down the valley and alarmed the Yankee home front by menacing the outskirts of Washington, D.C. with 14,000 gray-clad troops on July 11th. Far from giving Grant a free hand in the formulation and execution of strategy, Lincoln intervened from the start and compromised the cordon approach that he had supposedly championed from the early days of the conflict. Grant wanted Banks to capture Mobile, Alabama, and deprive the Confederacy of its last major port on the Gulf of Mexico, which would greatly tighten the Union naval blockade and further starve the enemy's war machine. Lincoln, however, approved a harebrained scheme proposed by Nathaniel Banks to invade Texas um, um, uh, via Louisiana's uh, Red River. Not only was Banks's Red River expedition an unwarranted diversion, uh, that detracted from Grant's coherent strategy. But the evidence indicates that it was motivated more by a desire to obtain new cotton supplies for Northern speculators than the illusory hope that it could reclaim Texas for the Union. Banks aborted his expedition after suffering two embarrassing defeats at the hands of numerically inferior con uh, Confederate uh, forces, land forces, and he came uncomfortably close to losing the naval component of his uh, combined uh, uh, expedition when water levels dropped on the Red River. A more competent Union general would move against Mobile in March 1865, and the city fell on April 12th three days after uh, General Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox and two days before Lincoln's assassination. Although Grant um, must have resented Lincoln's meddling, he had the good sense not to show it, which accounts in large part for why he and the president got along as well as they did. The same could not be said for the vague perfectionist, Philadelphia's pride, Major General George Bruton McClellan, uh, the, the architect and first commander of the Army of the Potomac, uh, the Union's largest field army, and also Lincoln's general in chief from November 1st, 1861 to March 11th, 1862. The disrespect that little Mac exhibited toward his commander in chief has not helped his, his historical reputation uh, among generation after generation of Americans steeped in Lincoln worship. McClellan was clearly less of an asset to the Union. Uh, and its cause than Lincoln, but his conduct did not stem entirely from haughty self-assurance. 
One of the reasons McClellan did not confide in Lincoln on military matters was that he believed politicians were blabbermouths. Imagine that. While Lincoln was much more circumspect than McClellan realized, other members of the administration justified the general's apprehensions. This made a working relationship between McClellan and Lincoln close to impossible. The wonder is that Lincoln stood the situation as long as he did. Other regular army officers viewed Lincoln with similar contempt, and history has not dealt kindly with them. It needs to be stated, however, that Lincoln never achieved sufficient understanding of the cultural ethos that produced the U.S. Army's professional officer corps. These men believed that officers were made, not born. The War of 1812 taught Winfield Scott and other gentlemen who decided to commit their lives to the profession of arms that the nation's security depended on maintaining a hardened cadre of seasoned professional soldiers. Those admitted to this indispensable fraternity would have to pass through years of rigorous education and training within the monastic confines of the US Military Academy, followed by more years of practical experience through war and peace. Officers who withstood the purging regimen at West Point resented politicians who failed to respect their expertise and pulled strings to award commissions to influential constituents with no military background. On July 16, 1838, Cadet Henry Wager Halleck complained, it is hard for us to be placed under citizens who have spent no time in preparation for their commissions, while we have spent four or five years here at hard toil fitting ourselves for the various duties of our stations. It was bad enough that Lincoln doled out a significant number of general's appointments to politicians who were as ignorant of soldiering as he was. What really rankled the Republic's uh, professional soldiers was having Lincoln double guessing them altering their plans and pressing them to attack before they were sure of victory. As a boy captain, George Armstrong Custer served on McClellan's staff and he imbibed his chief's truculent attitude toward the president. In the serialized Civil War memoirs that Custer published in the months preceding his death at the Little Bighorn on June 25th, 1876, he let those feelings resurface. While commenting on an order Lincoln issued on January 27, 1862, directing, quote, a general movement of the land and naval forces of the United States against the insurgent forces, uh, end quote, Custer observed, this order cannot be classed among the many wise productions from the pen of President Lincoln. It was what might be expected, however, from an unmilitary man anxious and zealous to perform a military act forgetting that it required in its inception and execution the highest professional ability and training known to the profession of arms. In other words, most professional soldiers thought Lincoln was no more qualified to tell them how to do their duty than he was to perform surgery. Ironically, it was the indignant Cadet Halleck who turned into the man that enabled Lincoln to bridge this gap. The closest thing that passed for a military intellectual in the antebellum army, Halleck filled a staff assignment in California after its conquest by American forces in early 1847. Jettisoning the professional soldier's code of non-involvement in civilian politics, he became a delegate to the convention that drafted California's state, conven uh, state uh, constitution. While still retaining his military commission, Halleck served as California's Secretary of State joined a San Francisco law firm and became a leading force in urban development. After resigning from the army on August 1st, 1854, Halleck went into business and earned a fortune. He also became a noted authority on land title issues and international law. Halleck donned a uniform once more with the outbreak of the Civil War and soon received command of Union troops in the West. Lincoln named him general in chief in July, 1862. Content to act as a coordinator and administrator, Halleck did not turn out to be the decisive supreme commander that the president desired. Yet because Halleck understood both the military mind and the civilian world, he became an effective communications conduit, helping Union generals to understand and accept Lincoln's directives. At the same time, he interpreted military jargon and explained the assumptions of the Union brass to the commander in chief. When Grant succeeded Halleck as general in chief in March, 1864, the latter continued to play this vital role 
by staying on as his new superior's chief of staff. Thanks to this three-way partnership forged by Lincoln, Halleck, and Grant, the Republic and its army arrived at a healthy relationship and uh, persevered to win a huge and terrible war. Excuse me, I take a slight pause. Success in war is usually purchased by sacrificing human lives, both those of the enemy and your own people. This is true even when a president or his military commanders make the right decisions. Leaders who recoil from this formula or who hesitate to embrace it often end up presiding over defeats. Lincoln acquired a facility for making hard decisions just when they would deliver the most impact. Although his increasingly radical policies exacerbated the Confederacy's distress, they also unleashed forces that Lincoln could not always control. His most inspired and extreme move, the Emancipation Proclamation, propelled a nation torn by a war that had already set records in bloodletting and cash expenditures into a social revolution of unprecedented scale. Lincoln combined this blow against slavery with an invitation to African Americans to join the Union Army as soldiers. That turned out to be an equally fateful step that caused the conflict to sink to new, le to new levels of savagery. When Lincoln offered blacks a chance to fight for the Union, he also gave them the opportunity to carve a new place for themselves in the country's post-war social and political order. That was the vision that inspired many men of color to enlist. As an anonymous member of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment wrote to a black religious newspaper, if we understand the Declaration of Independence, it asserts the freedom and equality of all men. We ask nothing more. Give us equality and acknowledge us as men and we are willing to stand by the flag of our union and support the leaders of this great government until every traitor shall be banished from our shore. Lincoln would vindicate these hopes by citing black military service as his reason for refusing to publicly distance himself from emancipation even after it appeared to become a political liability uh, during his 1864 reelection campaign. He also hinted toward the end of his life that black veterans should be allowed to vote. By accepting men of color as soldiers, however, Lincoln touched the white South on the raw nerve of its most dreaded fear, the threat of race war and servile insurrection. That in turn made the Union's black defenders the objects of hatred and the targets of numerous atrocities. To understand the backlash elicited by the creation of the United States colored troops, we must examine the values and anxieties that drove the white South to secede in the first place. A major reason why Confederates fought so fiercely to defend slavery is that they could not conceive of it being ended peacefully. The rationale justifying human bondage not only held that blacks were inferior to people of European descent, but that they were also inherently savage and would turn on the white population if they were ever set loose. This is what Thomas Jefferson meant when he confided sadly to a friend on April 22nd, 1820. But as it is, we have the wolf by the ear and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale and self-preservation in the other. Jefferson expressed the same thoughts more succinctly four years later. We have the wolf by the ears and feel the danger of either holding or letting him loose. For as much as slavery troubled the author of the Declaration of Independence, he could not see a safe way for the South to release the wolf. The bloody excesses that attended the Haitian Revolution of 1792 and Matt Turner's slave revolt in Virginia in 1831 convinced white Southerners, including non-slaveholders, that the loss of control over the slave population would result in a merciless race war that would end in the extermination of either the section's whites or its blacks. These assumptions, valid or not, go a long way toward explaining the outraged voice by white Southerners in response to the militant abolitionist movement that arose in the North in the 1830s. Radicals like William Lloyd Garrison not only posed a threat to the South's pride 
uh, and moral, economic, and political standing, but also to its white population's personal safety. That was why Virginia Congressman Henry A. Wise, a future Confederate general, denounced mounting abolitionist agitation in 1835 with these words. Sir, slavery is interwoven with our very political existence, is guaranteed by our constitution, and its consequences must be borne by our northern brethren as resulting from our system of government, and they cannot attack the institutions of slavery without attacking the institutions of the country, our safety, and welfare. In other words, white Southerners regarded abolitionists as irresponsible fanatics intent on deluging Dixie with blood by fomenting slave revolts. The deterioration of relations between the North and South heightened these fears, and Southern newspapers fed the apprehensions of their readers by giving credence to rumors of slave revolts. This sensational but vague account from the December 20th, 1856 edition of the Southern Shield of Helena, Arkansas, typified the genre. <clears throat> and I quote, great alarm has existed in many localities in the South in regard to contemplated civil insurrections. In some instances, developments have been made which leave no doubt that serious outbreaks may have occurred, but for the timely and extremely fortunate discovery of the fiendish plans concocted by misguided and ignorant blacks. Atrocious murders of whole families might have been committed at the first outbreak, but it would have ultimately resulted in certain death to the perpetrators, for it is idle for the slave population to think that an insurrection can result in anything but destruction to all who engage in it. The anti-slavery mass murderer, John Brown, seemingly uh, provided irrefutable uh, confirmation of these fears when he seized the federal arsenal at Harpers Ferry, Virginia in that October, 1859, in an abortive effort to launch a slave revolt massive and bloody enough to terrorize the white South into ending the peculiar institution. The fact that so many white Northerners hailed Brown as a martyr after his conviction and hanging in Virginia convinced their Southern cousins that they would never be safe as long as they remained in the Union. By that time, white Southerners equated the Republican party with the abolitionist movement when Abraham Lincoln, a Republican dedicated to the containment and gradual elimination of slavery, won the White House in November 1860, that was enough to turn secession from a threat into a reality. At the opening of the Civil War, Lincoln insisted that he was waging a crusade to save the Union as it existed in 1860, with slavery as a sacrosanct state right. Racial hysteria left Confederates impervious to his words, but such a message reassured the North's war Democrats who rallied around the stars and stripes to strike down secession and rebellion, but not the peculiar institution. As the struggle stretched into the summer of 1862, however, Lincoln decided that emancipation was necessary to undermine the Confederate war effort. When Lincoln coupled his emancipation proclamation on January 1st, 1863 with an open appeal to African Americans to join the Union Army, it seemed as if the Confederacy's worst nightmare was about to become fact. If, as Southern whites believed, Blacks were ungovernable savages, then Lincoln's decision to arm them meant total war, war against Southern men, women, and children. This new Northern policy inflamed Confederates in the same way that the British use of Indians to raid the colonial frontier infuriated earlier generations of Americans during the revolution and then the young Republic, the War of 1812. 12 days after Lincoln promulgated the Emancipation Proclamation, Jefferson Davis told the Confederate Congress that the measure was really designed to encourage Southern slaves to rise in a general assassination of their masters. The Confederate president added that Lincoln's initiative deserved to be regarded as the most execrable measure recorded in the history of guilty man. The Southern press echoed Davis's outraged, outraged sentiments. The Washington Telegraph in Washington, Arkansas roundly denounced the crime of Lincoln in seducing our slaves into the ranks of his army as amongst those stupendous wrongs against humanity, shocking to the moral sense of the world like Herod's massacre of the innocents or the eve of St. Bartholomew. Situated in more cosmopolitan Little Rock, 
the Arkansas Gazette proclaimed with grim firmness, our course is plain. A savage war has been forced upon us. We will have to meet and deal with it as we find it. The competing true, true Democrat, another Little Rock newspaper, agreed that Lincoln had initiated a war for extermination, not only of men, but of women and children. The Gazette went so far as to urge that the Confederate government adopt a draconian policy. Army Negroes as soldiers or otherwise are doing anything to incite them to insurrection is a worse crime than the murder of any one individual. Therefore, all officers and soldiers willingly serving in armies guilty of such practices should be punished as murderers. The fact that these crude racial stereotypes lacked factual substance did not prevent Confederate soldiers and civilians from clinging to them. We see the power conspiracy theories down to our own time. Delusion was part of the price that the white South paid for slavery as it allowed the master class and its dependents to live with an immoral labor system and to applaud indefensible conduct on the battlefield. Belief in a savage and inhumane enemy makes soldiers feel that they are absolved from treating such opponents according to the rules of war. Such sentiments had inspired Anglo-American troops to massacre Indian combatants and non-combatants on numerous occasions since the 1600s. These same fears made it almost inevitable that Confederate troops would commit atrocities when they encountered elements of the US colored troops. On one level, the killing of wounded and captured black soldiers represented acts of vengeance against uh, men Confederates viewed as renegades who had dared to raise their hands against their masters. In a more important sense, though, rebel troops viewed these merciless acts as a distasteful but essential form of race control. It was better to kill those African Americans who had defected to the enemy in order to deter a wholesale slave revolt. The Washington Telegraph exhibited this sort of thinking when it justified the massacre of members of the first Kansas Colored Infantry, later known as the 79th U.S. Colored Infantry, following the Battle of Poison Spring, Arkansas, on April 18, 1864. It follows irresistibly that we cannot treat Negroes taken in arms as prisoners of war without a destruction of the social system for which we contend. In this, we must be firm, uncompromising, and unfaltering. We must claim the full control of all Negroes who may fall into our hands to punish with death or any other penalty or remand to their owners. If the enemy retaliate, we must do likewise. And if the black flag follows, the blood be upon their heads. An Arkansas cavalryman who witnessed the Poison Spring Massacre expressed the lesson to be learned uh, from it in a, less, in a letter, a letter, I'm sorry, in a letter to his wife. Our men is determined not to take Negro prisoners. And if all of the Negroes could have seen what occurred that day, they would stay at home. Black soldiers repaid the rebels in the same coin when they could. And the escalating violence prompted a white Union officer stationed in Arkansas to write his wife, it would not surprise me in the least if this war would ultimately be one of extermination. Its tendencies are in that direction now. Lincoln had remarked many times about the vicious racial prejudice that infected his America, and he had to know that unleashing the Union's sable arm would provoke a cycle of atrocity and reprisal. After all, the rebel populace had greeted invading uh, federal forces during the war's first year with fierce guerrilla resistance that frequently transgressed the rules of war. Even a man far less intelligent than Lincoln had to expect that adding black soldiers to such a highly charged environment would add more fuel to his enemy's fury. America's 16th president had been born in Kentucky, which made him a son of the South. He was fully aware of the region's fears and prejudices. Experience had probably also taught him that there was no gentle way to uproot slavery from American soil and permitting black men to participate in the trauma-ridden process was probably the best way to assure them a place in the post-war order. While Confederates bear the primary responsibility for their own war crimes, the Union president could have done more to deter them. Lincoln responded to rebel threats to re-enslave captured black soldiers and the inevitable reports of racial massacres by promising to respond in kind but he shied away from any open retaliation. 
He seemed to think that African Americans in uniform would find their surest protection in the destruction of the Confederacy. At the same time, he wanted to avoid worsening the lot of white Federals in enemy hands. The Lincoln administration did cite the Confederate refusal to treat black soldiers according to the rules of war as an excuse for shutting down an already brittle prisoner of war exchange system. In one respect, this represented a shrewd strategy. Refusing to exchange captured rebel troops prevented an outnumbered Dixie from replenishing the shrinking ranks of its army, while the more numerous North could find plenty of fresh recruits and draftees to replace its losses. Lincoln turned a blind eye to the murder of captured black troops on the battlefield to avoid creating a cycle of retaliation that would engulf white Union prisoners as well. He could have easily continued the exchange system for the same reason, but doing otherwise paid immediate military dividends. At the same time, however, this policy carried a tragic price. It deliberately exposed tens of thousands of men in blue and gray to needless suffering and death. Because neither side was willing to devote sufficient resources to make their prison camps healthy installations, the surest way to keep POWs alive was to speedily parole them to friendly lines where they would remain out of combat until finally exchanged. In addition to closing this safety valve, the Lincoln administration reacted to the Fort Pillow massacre of April 12, 1864, the most publicized war crime involving the US colored troops by drastically slashing rations in Northern prison camps. Lincoln had full knowledge of this covert revenge policy and he never lifted a finger to end it. These were cold blooded measures and we must remember them as elements of the kind of war Abraham Lincoln waged. Now, nothing said here should unseat Lincoln as the greatest war president in American history. I would not presume to, to attempt such a thing. He identified his mission as preserving the Union, humanity's last chance for a free future, and he let nothing stop him from accomplishing it. He defined the office of commander in chief, something the Constitution failed to do by exercising unparalleled powers. He bore the burden of leading his people through an agonizing ordeal and he attempted to bind up the nation's wounds even before the guns fell silent. Right. Nevertheless- But we're, we've got five minutes left for Q&A and wrap up, just so you know. I'm, I'm almost done. Nevertheless, okay. it is well to remember that war means suffering, something from which this nation remains largely insulated even after a decade of military engagement uh, around the world, particularly now in Afghanistan. Uh, those who lead their nations to war are impelled to make hard decisions that cause immeasurable pain. Any evaluation of their performance must factor that consideration into the equation. Uh, but uh, and we tend to censor ourselves when we, when we describe our wars, uh, which makes it easy to start new ones. Uh, and that should never be easy. Thus, when we call Abraham Lincoln an outstanding war leader, we must never forget uh, that means he excelled at a hellish business. He had to run his hands through rivers of blood before history uh, could place the conqueror's laurel on his brow. And I apologize for running long. Hang on, here we go. Greg, no, that was fun. I hated to pull the plug because I we oh. were listening so intently. You really did it. I was I was just on the verge of uh, finishing, but but uh, yep. thanks for keeping me honest. Sorry about that. I, I, it's the, my least favorite part of my job. But anyway, uh, so since we have only a, a minute or two, so a few minutes left, let me get to the a question. Can you address the role of Robert E. Lee in the racial massacres? And can you address the contemporary controversy over the removal of statues of Lee? Well, that's, 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 that's a big one. Lee, um, uh, the, the biggest racial massacre that occurred uh, on his watch, so to speak. I mean, he wasn't everywhere in the Confederacy. And so the worst of these things happened in the Trans-Mississippi in the Western Theater where he was not present. Uh, and that was the, uh, the uh, uh, response to the, uh, uh, the attack on the crater, uh, uh, the Petersburg lines in the summer of 1864. And Lee wasn't, wasn't personally present there. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I don't know if he, if he can be assigned person, personal guilt. He, he didn't investigate the matter. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and that was, 
that was standard practice among a number of Confederate officers. Uh, a couple times in the West, uh, uh, Confederate uh, subordinate uh, uh, commanders reported to their superiors, we've taken some of these, they would use different words, but some of these black people in battle, what should we do with them? Uh, and uh, uh, Edmund Kirby Smith, uh, commander of the uh, Trans-Mississippi on one occasion said, why, why don't you just Why'd you take him prisoner? <laughs> we got these legal problems. That was also that also came up after the attack on Fort Wagner by by the 54th Massachusetts, and some mm-hmm. wild blacks fell into Confederate hands. Uh, removal of Lee statues. Um, hmm. You know, I grew up with with this view of the Civil War as this noble contest between two groups of good people who were equally brave. We tend to view it in different ways now, at least many of us do. Um, I, from a sense of nostalgia, I hate to see uh, some of these monuments coming down, but I understand uh, how as communities change, they find uh, such statues offensive. Um, it's, you know, it's just where 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 does one draw the line? Uh, some some I think some it's it's become oh they were all traitors. Well, they didn't think they were traitors. They weren't declared traitors by the Supreme Court until 1869. Lincoln never used the T word because he realized that would be opening a can of worms. He'd say rebels, you know, uh, but but he never called them traitors. Um, and um, on the other hand, if I was an African-American and I walked past, past a courthouse uh, that had a symbol of, of the Jim Crow regime that oppressed me and my families, uh, instead of being a privileged white male, which I am, I might have a very different viewpoint. I might not be as, I might not be equivocating like I am right now, uh, but that, that's not a definitive answer, but it's something I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to struggle with and I can see different points of view on, on this question. Yep, uh, you did well, Greg. <laughs> No, no, really, it's a tough, there's, there's no right answer to it, I think. Um, it's just one of those tough ones that we can find 10 answers for the question, and, and that's just the way it is. So we will have to deal with it as we go along. So, Greg, it is just about 7.30, so it is time that we say adieu. So thank you very, very much for an incredibly uh, just exuberant and animated presentation. It was really fun to watch and listen to. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as, as I did. I'm sure the staff did. So, so thank you once again for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to do it. And uh, we'll look forward to, to you keep plucking away at teaching Civil War history in Philadelphia and reminding students there was a 19th century and there was a Civil War. So, so thank you for all that. All right, now I've just got a few public announcements to make for the members. So, uh, so we have some programs coming up. Surprise, surprise, right? So our first one is on March the 4th. It is a public affairs program with Henry Olson, who is a Washington Post columnist, and he will talk about the future of the Republican Party, something that is in the news every day, given uh, the, um, the storm and drong that seems to be going on within the party itself right now. So that's March the 4th, Henry Olson. All right, March the 9th, a Liberty Series program featuring Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey. Uh, who's always, you know, worth listening to. I mean, he's just got always something to say that's, that's really worth it. And he will talk on values, principles, and issues, because he is a principled man. So, and then March 24th, our Civil War Roundtable will feature Dr. Michael Gerhardt, who is the Burton Craig Distinguished Professor of Jewish Prudence at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he will talk about his new book called Lincoln's Mentors, the uh, the education of a leader. So you can see there's, we, after 156 years, there's still plenty to learn about Abraham Lincoln. It just never fails, uh, at least I think. So So that's our wrap up for the night, folks. So thank you all for watching once again. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you hopefully next week on March the 4th. Stay well, stay care, and stay warm. Goodbye, everybody.